going everyone i hope you're all keeping safe and well my name is james dooley and i'm the auditor of this year's ucd economic society and i'm joined here today by our events officer dave fitzgerald hello so before we start i would once again like to thank pwc for their continued support in supporting the society throughout the year today we have a very special guest for our members as you all know we the society looks to present the thomas kettle award for outstanding contribution to economics and public policy. And, th and despite being in Ireland's third extensive lockdown, this year will be no different. Last year's recipient of the award included um, the Nobel Prize laureate, Professor Joseph Stiglitz. And other recipients of the award include uh, Peter, Peter Sutherland, David McWilliams, Jeffrey Sachs, and Bob Geldof. And today I am very excited to announce that we are including Mr. Philip Lane to this distinguished list. So Philip Lane's list of achievements and academic credentials are both numerous and distinguished. And it, if it is okay with you, Philip, it will be in my best interest to enlighten our members of some of these. As former professor of international macroeconomics and director of the Institute for International Integration Studies at Trinity College Dublin, Philip was elected a scholar in economic and social studies in Trinity before receiving a doctorate in economics at Harvard University in 1995. He was a research fellow of the Center for Economic Policy Research and have been a visiting scholar at the International Monetary Fund and the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and a consultant to the European Commission. Philip has previously served as governor of the Central Bank and currently is a member of the executive board to the, of the ECB since June 2019 and is among the top 5% of economists in the world according to the research papers in economics. So on behalf of the UCD Economic Society, I would like to add one more honor to this distinguished list and congratulate Mr. Philip Lane on being awarded the Thomas Kettle Award for 2021. I would now like to invite Mr. Lane to offer a few words to some of our listeners listening here today. Thank you, James. Uh, so indeed, I I'm honored to receive this award. Uh, Tom Kettle was the first professor of economics at UCD, UCD. Um, at this point over 100 years ago, uh, but of course the Irish economics profession is quite quite small, so, so to have that connection to uh, one of the, the uh, founding fathers of economics in, in the Irish university system is indeed an honour. Let me maybe point out as well with Tom Kettle that in fact he had a mixed uh, career, so he, he was obviously uh, had his academic career he was also involved in, in uh, politics, in journalism. Uh, he was a poet uh, and he was very involved in the policy debate. And maybe again, uh, to, to some extent, uh, to the extent I like, like some of your previous recipients have, have mixed academic work with policy work. Uh, I think uh, it, it's uh, indeed uh, that that's a strong connection back, back to Tom Kettle. So uh, thank you, James. Thank you, David. Thank you to the Society for this award. Cool. So if we uh, we will kick on with the first question so that we have for you today, Philip. So according to many of the economic commentators worldwide, the fiscal policy mistake 10 years ago suggests that austerity was a big mistake. So in your opinion, do you think in light of the pandemic, austerity will make a comeback? Okay, so that's, a, that's a, a big question to start off. I mean, behind that, and again, uh, it's important to, I think, avoid uh, too many labels in, in this discussion. I mean, I think what is universally agreed is uh, essentially the fiscal multiplier is larger than was uh, believed uh, 10 years ago. Uh, and that is maybe connected to, to two issues. Uh, one is in a low interest rate world um, that essentially the historically sometimes uh, uh, fiscal policy could have been, if you like, offset by monetary policy. So if there was too much austerity, uh, you know, a, an easing of monetary policy by the central bank might have meant that the you know, macro impact would have been uh, uh, neutralized. But in a low interest rate world, uh, central banks can only do so much. So, so that's one basic uh, reason. The other reason uh, is basically um, uh, it's turned out that our beliefs about the labor market have needed revision. 
So again, 10 or 12 years ago, the unemployment rate that would have triggered inflation was uh, projected to be much higher than it actually turned out to be. So you see that in the US, I think you see it in Europe, it is that in fact, the ability of the economy to respond to fiscal policy is a lot larger than one's expected. So then the final part of your question, going back to austerity, will, will it come back? I mean, I think what's important uh, to think about after this pandemic is we know uh, debt ratios will have gone up. They are going up. And uh, I, I do think um, we will at some point face a situation of we're going to need a fiscal policy to support a reduction in the debt ratio. So if you want to put a label of austerity on that, then you know uh, that conversation will be needed. Uh, and that's that that is the kind of uh, uh, kind of circle of fiscal policy. In order to allow the fiscal policy, we've seen uh, on this occasion very large deficits. You need in, in if you like in normal times uh, to rebuild that capacity. So, so, you know, I think uh, in your very general question, uh, as you can see from my answer, there's quite a lot underneath that, as opposed to a simple uh, yes, no uh, situation. Perfect. Um, if I can just jump in there for a second. Do you, Philip, believe that Ireland and Europe has positive prospects for economic growth following this pandemic? We're informed of high household savings and big corporate savings in Ireland. So do you think consumer spending will rebound, rebound strongly and have a business spending or business investment will that rebound strongly as well? So, so I think um, uh, that's mostly true. So, so with the pandemic, the, the cause of the recession has been the, the virus. And uh, once we contain the virus through vaccinations and, and other medical solutions, um, th there should be a fairly strong uh, bounce back in the economy. But uh, what, what is true is whether you get a 100% full uh, recovery uh, depends on, on confidence. And uh, you know, it's, it's not so clear, it remains a debate for consumers about when will they be fully confident. And in the European context, when we've had a, a very large uh, period of stagnation after the global financial crisis, the narrative, which is probably already in the US, of a strong recovery uh, may take time for, for that to happen. On business investment, uh, let me make a two-parter there. Uh, one, of course, Ireland has a lot of multinational firms, and a lot of these firms are in sectors which have been doing well, like pharmaceuticals and technology. So, you know, I think they will continue to strongly. And then uh, after that, for those of you studying economics, Investment uh, is very much driven by the overall economy, so the investment accelerator view. So in other words, uh, investment is not really uh, a, a separate kind of uh, dimension. If the household spending comes back, if there's a strong uh, a consumption demand, then that'll be uh, reinforced by investment. Equally, if the consumer does not come back, uh, the, the case for investment uh, in the domestic economy uh, will also be weak. So in the end, I think uh, the debate is about whether the recovery will be 100% or 95%. So most, you know, it's, but, but those 5% percentage points uh, make a big difference. Uh, and maybe the other point is, uh, one with, with what we've seen now uh, uh, with working from home, there will be questions about different sectors of the economy. So whether the same demand for city center office blocks will be there, but under the hand for, for uh, investment in uh, uh, suburban locations, in, in uh, working from home technology uh, may be reinforced. And then the other uh, issue, which is a coincidence of timing, is uh, the, the carbon agenda, the climate change agenda is increasingly strong. And uh, as you know, with a lot of the European uh, recovery plans, it's centered on accelerating investment in, in, a, in a green recovery. That needed to happen anyway, uh, but maybe that will also provide a, another engine for, for investment. So we might see more public investment than normal uh, until uh, the private investment uh, sector comes back. Okay, unreal. Yeah, two very insightful answers there, Philip. Thanks so much. 
So moving on to more towards the role of the ECB, how can it, uh, what is the role of the ECB in funding member states' recovery from the pandemic? So, I mean, I've used the, the phrase confidence a couple of times there. And in fact, you know, here we are basically nearly exactly one year uh, since we had to intervene in a big way with, with the PEP program, the Pandemic Emergency Purchase Program. And uh, at that time, it was natural that many investors were quite nervous. What would be the impact of this pandemic? So we had uh, private investors uh, in, around the world look to dash for cash. So looking basically to avoid holding any kind of long dated asset. So the first step of the ECB was this to basically by saying, look, uh, we are here, uh, we can be uh, provide a, a lot of liquidity to the market. That had a big stabilizing effect. So um, through, through that kind of a stabilizing effect, uh, th that's to me the, the dominant role is if the world knows we, we are here, uh, we, we are a backstop, then, then you as an individual investor can return to, to the bond market because the kind of instability has been ruled out. Now, on top of that, uh, we had already been doing QE and now we've been doing more QE. Um, and uh, essentially when we uh, take bonds out of the, the market and uh, put them into our balance sheet, um, how does that work? It means it, it drives down interest rates. And by driving down interest rates, all types of, of borrower, so whether it's uh, households looking for a mortgage, firms needing to fund uh, their working capital or longer term investment, or governments, as you say, uh, can find it easier to do that. Let me make an important point it is that this time, uh, by and large, uh, government deficits have been financed essentially by, by the household sector. Uh, whereas, as you know, uh, in the global financial crisis, the big problem was when uh, countries like Ireland or Greece or Spain uh, owed a lot of money to foreign investors. So, uh, and that's not part of what's happened this time. And so what we have now is essentially within the same economy, I want to say the same economy, I mean the euro area economy, it's an internal transaction. It's not, and from that point of view, it's much less a, of a macroeconomic concern uh, than, we, than we saw in 2008. Brilliant. You know, you talked about quantitative easing there. I, I wondered how fast you think we can bounce back from, in Ireland at least, our current structural deficit, which is at 22% of GDP. And what tax regime do you think will be deployed over the coming years in Ireland, and I suppose more generally in Europe as well, um, once the recovery begins, um, begin, begins from the pandemic? No, it's an interesting uh, point. So we think uh, most of it uh, will just be kind of automatic. So, so the, I mean, right now the measurement of what, what is a structural deficit versus what is a cyclical deficit it is kind of a, a bit complicated because there's all sorts of special key schemes like the uh, the pandemic unemployment payment, uh, the supports to to firms. So th they are, if you like, structural. They're not automatic stabilizers, but equally, you know, the government will be able to uh, withdraw those or cancel those uh, when the economy improves and the pandemic is controlled. So a lot of the measures will automatically go into reverse uh, when the pandemic is contained. Um, and you know what is left at that point in a couple of years from now goes back to, to what I highlighted earlier on. You know, we will have a higher debt ratio uh, across the world. And um, the big question is, is it, is it okay to leave these debt ratios at a high level? Or should you run uh, some kind of modified fiscal policy, including um, as you say, may, maybe some uh, new taxes uh, to bring debt levels down to a lower level. Um, and, and, you know, I think um, it's important to emphasize it, is that it's, again, it's not like uh, before. I mean, before here and elsewhere, there was a, a kind of gap to close. New taxes were needed or spending cuts were, were, were needed. Right. On this occasion, the deficit gap will close by itself, but what will remain is a high debt level 
and it will be a, a big political issue about uh, how much and what kind of measures to take to get that that, that ratio down. Um, but but that's you know I think uh, in the medium term distance it's not an immediate issue. Very good. Okay, thanks, Emil Philip. So, um, following on from that question, uh, more towards the Brexit side of things, uh, we just have a couple of questions uh, for you in respect of both Brexit's repercussions and benefits we can expect to see over the coming years. So, in your opinion, Philip, how is Ireland positioned to benefit from Brexit at all, or do you think any sectors will boom over the coming years? So co collectively, of course, when we introduce a, a more difficult uh, trading relationship with the UK, that's collectively is, is, is bad news. You know, so, so it just, there's no getting away from that. Now, having said that, uh, there will be uh, differentiated effects. So many small businesses in Ireland, if they are, if they were exporters, primarily they were exporting to the UK. Uh, and, and that door is going to be a lot more uh, difficult, even under a free trade agreement. Um, but, you know, in terms of reorganizing, reshaping the Irish economy, as you, you can read every day, there's a reorientation of logistics. So having more uh, shipping direct from the continent into Ireland to avoid the UK, to be reorientation of um, uh, What's interesting, maybe with retail, is maybe more willingness to use uh, local retailers because of the headaches and admin head headaches of trying to buy something from a UK website now. So, so there might be some um, local winners, uh, and then obviously in financial services, uh, of course, over the last year or two, there has been a degree of relocation towards Dublin from the UK at, to provide financial services in, in the EU. But, but I, I would say um, it, it's definitely um, uh, Ireland uh, is uniquely uh, shaped uh, by this. But again, maybe from the point of view uh, of you and, and your, your uh, student colleagues, what's very important is Ireland is unique in retaining the, the common, common uh, labour market. So, so the fact that uh, Irish, Irish uh, people still have access to the UK labour market is very different to the situation on continental Europe. Perfect. Um, we have one last optional topic, which is uh, which is actually James's question. So I, I, I think I'll let it's his baby. So I think I'll let him ask it. But do you have do you have time, Philip? Is that okay? Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fine. Yeah, go ahead. You far away, David. You can take it. Don't worry. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Well, I think this is actually quite a good question, so I'll read it off. So, James, there's no doubt that a lot of our student members watching this interview are deliberating over what career routes to pursue, to pursue after they finish their college degree. Colleges are always places, always place great bias on encouraging students to complete master's degrees or PhDs. However, some students prefer taking a gap year or doing an internship and going straight into the workforce. I myself plan on doing an internship next year if all goes well in the interview process. However, I'm completely unsure of what to do in the future. So my question to you, Philip, is do you think there is much benefit to be taken from pursuing a master's degree or a PhD? And furthermore, where do you see good employment opportunities nowadays for business and economic students? Okay, so that's uh, an interesting question. And of course, in my time in Trinity, I would have tried to answer that question many times to students who might come and see me and, and ask a similar question. So, you know, of course, uh, as you might guess, uh, in the end, your individual uh, circumstances, your own ambitions uh, will, will dominate everything else. But let me make a few points. Uh, one is um, uh, you have to think about your whole lifelong career, not just uh, you know, one, one step. Uh, I will say, you know, 20 years from now, 25 years from now, uh, as you become more senior in different organizations, depending on the organization, having a master's degree will make it often makes a difference. It, it often makes a difference that you, it's one way to kind of uh, filter out, does this person have the kind of range and breadth of experience and education needed for the most senior levels? Now, what that doesn't answer is whether you should do it immediately or uh, whether you, because often, and of course the universities have many part-time options for doing a master's degree side by side with your career. 
So I would say if you don't take one on immediately, uh, keep in mind that uh, many employers will, will help you and provide a uh, study leave and even help with fees uh, at some point. Uh, I would say as you get older, it, you know, your learning capacity does diminish over time. The brain cells start to erode. So, so there is a case for, 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 for doing it er sooner rather than later. And then of course, at the same time, I mean, if you get a very good job offer, you know, uh, you know uh, the work experience is also uh, super important. So, you know, I think there's, there's no one answer on that. Keep your options open. I mean, I, I would say in terms of economics, so again, you're the economic society, so I focus on economics. Uh, what uh, two points to make? One is mostly to be a professional economist, it, it is a PhD. So, so that 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 is. Uh, but again, it's possible, and the Irish universities are customized for that uh, to do a part time uh, side by side with a job in the future. And maybe the big uh, big differentiator compared to maybe twenty years ago now is any big data firm loves uh, economists. For two reasons, one is if you've studied econometrics and statistics, and you've you know studied some coding along the way, that's basically the foundation for a lot of what any big data firm does. So whether it's Amazon, Google, Facebook, they all hire a lot of economists these days. Uh, and then second, also the actual microeconomics, working out pricing, demand, and supply is very important for coding. You know. Uh, algorithms of, of different types, you know. So, so the, the kind of big data world, uh, economics is a very good entry point into that. Um, so I would say, you know, if you are studying economics at undergrad or postgrad level, in terms of uh, uh, the combination of that with, with data skills uh, and learning to, to uh, code is, is very useful. I would say in economics, whether undergrad or postgrad, there's such a huge range of what people end up doing. I mean, from my time uh, many years ago now, like 30 years ago, actually, this 91, we graduated 30 years ago. Uh, my, my, my kind of student colleagues are all over the world doing all sorts of different uh, occupations. So it, it really uh, has, has many pathways. Uh, and then, of course, going back to further education, uh, there's also different professional qualifications. So of course, many people with an economics back background might go into accountancy or, or another interesting one is law. So the combination of economics and law uh, can be very powerful as well. So David, I don't know uh, if, if that answers your, your question. I would say for PhD, um, it takes a while. So you, you really want to, to love the subject. So see, so you, you need to have a vocational uh, love for, for your subject. Whereas for a master's degree, it can be more calculated because the extent only takes a year uh, or two years, depending on the course. Um, um, I, I do know the, the global data show a master's degree has a high rate of return. Uh, going from a master's degree to a PhD, that's not so clear. So you'd, you'd want to love actually the knowledge and the, the kind of sense of satisfaction from doing a PhD as opposed to trying to think it's going to maximize your, your monetary income. Um, and then maybe the other point is, with all of these, uh, if the opportunity comes up to do your master's overseas, having that, uh, especially if coming from a small country like Ireland, again, not so much immediately, but 10 years from now, 20 years from now, having international experience of some sort is extremely helpful, especially uh, when, when uh, uh, we, where we live in a very small country. So, so I hope that answers to some, to some extent. Yeah, it certainly does. Thank you. There's a, certainly a return on investment for a master's degree. Anyway, it's, it's, it's how it's leading. Right. Um, okay, that, that's that's perfect. That's all our questions. And I think we're kind of wrapping up perfectly just, just on good. So, I mean, uh, again, it's, it's a pity, but of course, that's the world we're in uh, that we uh, uh, could, couldn't do this in person. But, but uh, exactly. again, uh, um, uh, th thank you so much. Yeah, if we get the opportunity next year, we'll, we'd love to have you in, even just to physically present you the award. Yeah, uh, okay, we can do that. Yeah, yeah, hopefully. James, do you want to take it away? Uh, yeah, I was just going to add uh, exactly say what David was uh, mentioning there. Obviously, we would love to have you in and present it in front of the student domain, but clearly we're still all glued to our laptops at home, so nothing's changed in the past year. But hopefully, anyway, we can get it uh, presented to you next year, or hopefully sooner anyway. But thanks so much for joining us today, Philip, and we really appreciate your time. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay. Good morning. Bye for now.